The world is full of people who believe in Jesus. But Jesus never said to believe. He said, if you want to be one of my disciples, follow me. There's a big difference between being a believer and being a disciple. This show, Red Letter Christianity, is about taking the words of Jesus seriously. You'll find them in the red letters of the Bible. If you take those words seriously and live them out, do the things that Jesus calls you to do, you will live a countercultural life. You'll stand opposed to the prominent moves of the culture. You will be a person who is a red letter Christian. Stay tuned and learn about a red letter Christian today. Hi, I'm Tony Campolo. I'm back with you again with this show, Red Letter Christians. And uh, my co-host today is, or should I say hostess, is Kathy Tricoli. Now, you probably know her because she's turned out all kinds of records and, and, and she's sung all over the world and she's famous. And here she is on the she's show famous. with me. <laughs> yes, welcome, Kathy. Look, you're, you, you, have to, you have to say CDs. You're still in the record Oh, days. that's right. I'm an old Albums. Uh, albums, <laughs> okay, okay. How you doing? I'm good, I'm glad to be here. When I realized we were doing this together, I know Mark Lowry did the last couple of shows with you, I thought, we could easily, with Campolo and Tricoli, do the Italian Gospel Hour. Uh, no kidding. And these people out there do not understand what Italians Tricoli. are like when they get together. Listen, we, get, we, we got a guest today. Yes. Uh, his name is Tyler Wig Stevenson. Yes. And uh, he's head of a thing called Two uh, Futures Project. That's the name of it, Two mm -hmm. Futures Project. He's a big guy in terms of nuclear disarmament. Uh, he is an evangelical. He comes with all kinds of evangelical credentials. Mm -hmm. uh, he worked with John Stott uh, as a study assistant. Yes. Uh, he uh, worked with uh, Senator Cranston, the late Senator Cranston, mm -hmm. in, a, in a project called Global Security Institute. That's, I got it down right here. A and uh, he's, he's been working on this for a good chunk of his life. And uh, he operates out of Nashville, but he's doing incredibly important things. And he's raising a question that I think we need to raise in the world today. Uh, do you have any thoughts before we even get him on the show? We're going to see a little video in a minute, but... Well, you know, when I was preparing for um, the shows and just reading about the guests, first of all, I'm excited about all the guests. What they're doing is amazing, and some of them just working in the trenches, um, which we need more of. But. I was, I think it's such a volatile subject, yes. especially in the times we're living in. And I was, I was anxious to talk to him because it's so hard to, it, it seems it's just like a fairy tale thought to have no nuclear weapons yeah. in well, the world. Well, you're going to have a good time talking to him, yeah. I'm sure. Uh, it, it, should, it should be noted that he's one of what we call the red letter Christian movement. Mm -hmm. These are young men and women who are all over the place doing all kinds of things for Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And they're operating out of a biblical mandate. They're, they're really operating in terms of what Jesus says in those famous red letters in the Bible. You know, the Bible has the words of Jesus highlighted in red. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's gonna be interesting to see what he has to say about what he's doing in relationship to the scriptures because he is a guy who's rooted in the word, in of, the God. word of God. Yeah. Well, that's the thing that I think is so intriguing to me, having, having his, his template be the gospel yeah. and having these opinions about nuclear war. Yeah, so. uh, and, and which raises the question, if Jesus was incarnated in the flesh right among us, if he was a guest on what the would show, he, what, would he say what would he say about the nuclear arms race? What would he say about all of these weapons what would he say about war itself? Right. And uh, this subject has uh, incredibly important significance right now, as you know, because, uh, you know, just, we just got the word that Bin Laden, uh, the head of Al-Qaeda, uh, is dead. He shot dead. Uh, a group of Navy SEALs uh, attacked a, a compound where he was hiding out, and, he, and he's dead now. And uh, we all it get sets nervous. It, well, I feel like, you know, it, it just makes this... Bo it's coming more to a boil, and yeah. so you're kind of looking around going, what's going to happen next? Yeah. Because I think it's just uh, the situation's just elevated in the sense of now what, what do we expect from Al-Qaeda? 
What do we expect? And during how the, do we defend ourselves? During the Cold War, uh, a guy from uh, the Defense Department came out to uh, see Billy Graham and lay down on the dining room table a map of the world. And he had all these little model rockets, each of which was supposed to have a nuclear warhead on it. And they were all situated all over. And he said, these are the Russians, these are ours, this is how many they have, this is how many we have. And Billy Graham was taking all of this in and suddenly he was hit, as he says, by the Holy Spirit. And with a sweep of his hand, boom, he knocked all the rockets off the table. And he said, get this demonic presence out of me. Get this demonic presence out of my house. And at that point, he became what we call a nuclear pacifist. He's not a pacifist in the full sense of the word. This is Billy Graham, you Billy said. Graham, yeah. yeah. But he says, we can no longer talk about nuclear weapons and talk about a just war. Because in a nuclear war, so many innocent people will be destroyed that you can't say that this war could ever be just. Right. So we're in for a very, very oh, interesting time. I'm exciting to talk yeah. to him. Now, uh, we, we got a, a little video that we're going to run just before he comes on. Uh, but after the video, uh, the next face you're going to see is none other than our guest, Tyler Wig Stevenson. So uh, take a look at what we see here on the screen. You can see it right here. goes. We seek the total elimination one day of nuclear weapons from the face of the earth. So today, I state clearly and with conviction, America's commitment to seek the peace and security of a world without nuclear weapons. Kathy, here's my friend, Tyler. Hi, Tyler. So good to meet you. Good to meet you. I'm sorry to be interrupting the Italian mojo. <laughs> though. I'm afraid I can't contribute to it. And you don't even look Italian. No, I'm not a, not a hint. I, uh, I, I have to tell you, when I was first um, introduced to what you're doing, it just felt so daunting. Like, how do you even begin to yeah. attack a subject like this and do what yeah. you want to do with it? Well, you know, it's, it's one of those issues that Christians these days are faced with a lot of causes. And oftentimes you want to be able to say, here's something you can do right away. You know, here's the thing you can do that's going to make an impact. Um, this issue is different than that. Uh, what we're about with the Two Futures Project, what I'm about when I go and talk with Christians, talk with churches, is this is a long haul issue of fidelity. Mm -hmm. um, so there are ways that we can slowly make change, but it's about changing a mindset and it's about bringing a whole gospel sensibility to the way we approach the really challenging and often divisive issue of but national security. But what is that step? What is the first, like changing the mindset? How do you go about that? Because that's huge. Yeah. I mean, especially in, in, what, in the days we're living in now. Sure, sure. Well, I mean, here's, here's the basic thing that's, that's teed up the Two Futures Project. Uh, during the Cold War, you could make an argument that you had to have nuclear weapons to deter nuclear attack. Right. And there were people who made that argument in good faith and who, who were um, doing the best they could morally. The problem is, in the post-Cold War era, this situation of nuclear haves and nuclear have-nots really isn't sustainable. And so the best analysts from the Cold War, like Reagan Secretary of State George Shultz, former Senator Sam Nunn, Henry Kissinger, former Secretary of Defense Bill Perry, gentlemen like these who were strong advocates of nuclear security during the Cold War are now saying these things can't exist indefinitely without being used. And they've said, not theologically speaking, uh, some of them are men of faith, 
that's, that's not the point. For, from where they're sitting as security experts, the situation is untenable going into the 21st century. And so that's, it's that logic that gave us the, the name for the Two Futures Project, that we see a world with nuclear weapons as a world where they're going to be used eventually. Uh, the only alternative is a world without them. So it's a matter of, uh, uh, first and foremost, it is a matter of security. Can you give us kind of a biblical mandate as to why Christians should be committed to this cause that you're espousing. Yeah. I mean, there must be that having come out of the background that you come from. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, on, on the one hand, I, you saw this video, and uh, I, I would look at that and I would say, you know, one nuclear weapon has effects that, that, that deeply impact things that evangelical Christians are already concerned about. So the loss of innocent life, uh, stewardship of the environment, the catastrophic effect that even one bomb would have on the poor and the world economy. So there's effects from one bomb that hit things that evangelicals already care about. But you take it a step further and you look at, I mean, there's, there's, no, there's no biblical ethic of war where you can just say, okay, you know, that, that's how we should be. But a good faith attempt has been made with the just war tradition. And the just war tradition says uh, the, way we, the way we deal with a, a violent world um, is, is that we have to orient ourselves toward peace. Um, and that needs to discipline the way in which we approach the use of force. And so there are certain criteria that say what you can and can't do in the pursuit of war. And a nuclear weapon categorically violates, uh, the use of a nuclear weapon categorically violates Why? those criteria. Why does it violate it? Well, one of the criteria is, is discrimination. You have to be able to discriminate between combatant and non-combatant. So innocent people are going to get killed exactly, in this. Exactly, exactly. Uh, another in massive numbers. In massive numbers. Now, I mean, you could, you could maybe come up with a case where you're using it far, far away from civilian populations. But another, and, and I think the definitive criteria, is you have to be able to say that what you're doing is going to result in more good than harm because uh, the, just, the, the founders of the just war tradition, these, these saints of the church, Augustine, Aquinas, they recognize that the use of force brings with it horrific consequences always. And so uh, you have to be able to say this is going to do more good than harm. You can't say that with a nuclear weapon because we've got a 65-year taboo against their use. Mm. And if you break that taboo, you open the possibility for escalation that I think is going to be absolutely catastrophic. And Tyler, this may be just an elementary question, but, you know, I think about, I mean, I'm not going to name them, but there's, you know, it's, it, there's a lot of madmen out there. Sure. And, and the term, you can't reason with a madman. Yeah. If, if you have the template of a rationale and a spirituality and the gospel as your right. template, how do you even begin to, to sway the, 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 the dictators and leaders right. that are, are using it as their trump card? Right. Uh, well, I'd first focus in on one, one, one aspect of that question, which is you're right. You, you, can't, you can't reason with someone who's irrational. But by that logic, a nuclear weapon doesn't protect you to begin with against someone who's irrational. Right. Uh, it doesn't protect you against a suicide bomber, certainly. Right. So we, we think of these things as sort of our existential trump card. But when you play that situation out, you already realize it's not doing too much work to defend you in the first place. Mm -hmm. The question of how you move ahead is, is bigger than, you know, that we're going to sit down with Kim Jong-il. Uh, I, I will name some people. Right. Uh, that we're going to sit down with some people and say, uh, and, you know, s convince them of the rightness of our position. What it is is about constructing um, constructing agreements um, whereby these weapons are delegitimized as, as weapons of war. And, and to do that, we have to have the moral high ground. So this is what I, this is what I mean when I say it's not a simple issue, you know, like here's, here's my $10, I'm going to make mm -hmm. an impact right now. Right. This is about the long-term uh, movement towards saying that weapons of mass destruction have no place in a world as interconnected as ours, and, and that we can build structures um, whereby it's not to say that we're going to reform the human heart. Uh, the human heart is that's, deceitful that's above the, all things. It right. will be until Jesus comes back. Right. Um, and there will be wickedness in the world. It's actually this conviction about the fallenness of humankind that makes me say, we have to come up with a way to secure these weapons, which have unbelievable effects yeah. to the best that we can because humankind is so fallen, not because we think we can construct utopia. Mm -hmm. I, I live in a world, and you live in a world, in which uh, we have terrorists. Uh, Bin Laden is dead. Yeah. Uh, there's a fear of retaliation. Yeah. To pick up her words, yeah. these, these are madmen. Yeah. These are people without conscience. 
These are people who have a burnt earth mentality. Right. How do you protect yourself against them? Yeah. I mean, we're not talking about, and when you're talking about well, a head of state, you. Yeah. you know, the premier of, of China, right. Right. The, even the premier of North, North Korea. Right. He's not going to uh, put his whole nation in danger of total annihilation. Uh, he's probably not going to do that. Probably not. But the reality is that these guys like Bin Laden, these suicide bomber types, right. they would be willing to see the whole world destroyed. Right. And here we are living in a world where, from what I understand, a lot of these nuclear weapons aren't very secure. I, I know of a couple of cases where all this protecting people from stealing them is, uh, is an anchor fence and a, and a couple of soldiers with machine guns. Yeah. Uh, what, what do you got to say about all of that? Yeah, well, that's a really good question. I mean, so, so two things. One, it's, it's precisely the possibility of a nuclear terrorist attack that, that, that drives me into this work because that's, that's what we can't prevent. That's, what, that's where deterrence just falls apart. And people haven't really thought about it. You know, people think about, the, th think about nuclear weapons using Cold War tools and they think about uh, terrorists using post 9-11 tools and we need to bring the two together and realize this is a really bad situation. Um, when I talk about a world free of nuclear weapons and I'm following the lead, uh, I would say, of people like George Shultz, of Senator Sam Nunn, I'm not talking about you know, persuading terrorists to be good guys. So first and foremost, it's keeping material out of their hands. Um, this is the thing. You can't make a nuclear bomb with something you find in your backyard. It takes an industrial activity. You have to steal that material or you have to steal a full-fledged weapon. I don't want to scare people. No, well, but a lot of stuff has should be a little already bit more disappeared, hasn't yeah. it? Uh, no, I, I would say the, the good news is uh, that nuclear weapons are safer than you might fear, and the bad news is oh, that nuclear weapons aren't as safe as they ought to be. Um, so a lot has been done to bolster, yeah, exactly, you know, sort of nuclear weapons stored in a potato shed somewhere in the former Soviet States. But I'm talking about, States. like, uh, the, uh, the uh, uranium stuff disappearing. Yeah. Um, the, we, we do have recorded instances of uranium being stolen. Uh, a lot of it has been, um, has been caught. Um, it takes a, a relatively small amount to make a nuclear weapon, uh, but this is precisely the danger. This is why it's not simply a matter of, oh, I've got a vision of what could be in 30 years. This is why we support concrete steps right now um, that will practically and pragmatically keep nuclear weapons out of terrorist That's hands. That's what I was going to ask about when you said you don't have a, pl it, you know, it's not, gonna, you're not going to wait till 30 years, because yeah. I was thinking, is there a plan to like change the next generation and the next generation? Yeah. So Kim Jong Il, you know his his children and his right. children's children right. have a have a different mindset, right? Because you feel like they're so they're so hell bent on their philosophies. Yeah. yeah. How do you change right now? Yeah. Is there a goal with your organization to see this happen in a year, five years, ten years, thirty years? Yeah. Well, yeah. Let me let me tackle that. So, I think that. If you want to get anywhere, you have to have a vision and you have to be able to take a first step. This is true for anything any of us want to do. I think that vision of uh, we need a goal, we need a world without nuclear weapons is absolutely critical so that we take the first step in the right direction. Because if that wasn't where we were aiming, if we go on thinking, well, some nations can have nuclear weapons and others can't, can't right. well, we are going to get into a situation where these things spread and they do fall into terrorist hands. I see that as an, ine an inevitability if we pr go down a certain road. Mm -hmm. But with that goal in place, you can take certain steps. To build, a nuclear, to build a nuclear arsenal, there are basically three things that have to happen. You have to have the, you have the material to make a bomb, which is a pretty daunting undertaking. You have to test a weapon, and you have to build and deploy arsenals. That's how we got a world that currently has 20, 23,000 nuclear weapons. Um, the way you... How many? 20 to 23,000, depending on how you're counting them. And, we're, and the, how many times over w the world would be destroyed if they were all employed? Oh, I, I, I couldn't 50, even be, 60, 100 I couldn't, times? I couldn't even begin to say. Yeah. The good news is this: we're looking at a success story. It might not seem like it, but we're down from uh, over 65,000 during the Cold War height in 1986, uh, largely due to the initiative started by President Reagan, who was the most fervent nuclear abolitionist ever to sit in the White House. But how we t start taking our first steps, those three goals at once. We do what we can to restrict the material, restrict terrorist access to the material, and condense it to make it as safe as possible where it is. We work on banning nuclear testing, because if you can't test a bomb, and this is why nuclear tests are such a big deal, 
If you can't test a bomb, you can't say you're a nuclear weapons state. So by banning testing, uh, we can prevent and really raise mm. the bar higher to the spread of nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. And we do so by reducing arsenals and taking them off hair trigger alert that we inherited from the Cold War. Um, we recently uh, entered into a new yeah. treaty with Russia that continues the process that President Reagan started. Uh, we need to see more of that. The U.S. and Russia have 95 percent of the world's nuclear weapons. Um, we have to lead by example. That's not to say then that we expect everybody else to yeah. fall in place. It's everybody going at the same time, but there's no question who has to take leadership what, here. What if the U.S. doesn't do it, nobody can. We're aiming this uh, show at young people, yeah. at youth, uh, across the nation and around the world. Yeah. Uh, is there something that Christian young people can do? Do you, have you guys put together uh, a, a biblical curriculum that they could yeah. use in That's Sunday school? That's a good school. idea. Uh, you, you haven't done that. Well, we, we have resources uh, available on our website. Resources sounds like I'm going to yawn. <laughs> Doesn't it sound like <laughs> yeah, we've got I, resources <laughs> on our website? Do you're you hired. Have you're hired. Or you're a new marketer. Do I have any stuff that I can say to a Sunday school class? I want you to read this. I want you to read these verses of Scripture from the Sermon on the Mount. What would Jesus do? Yeah. Raise those kinds of questions and get right. the discussion yeah. going. Right. All right. Well, here's one thing. There's, there's or a. Or just call our uncles. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We're Italian. We have uncles. And they take care of people like Ben Laden. You know, if we would have turned this over to the mafia instead of to the CIA, we even be it would have been this done. Conversation had, I'm sorry to make I, it I so I hate to simplistic. make it, but if the mafia had been handling Ben Laden instead of the CIA, agreed, it would have been, Kathy, over. Would have been over. Now I'm getting where the red and red letter Christians <laughs> come from. All right. Um, here's the thing. Uh, yeah, there, there, are, there are articles you can Make read. Make it fast, because we've already got a time. There's a DVD you can get, and then we have a faith in action study guide where people can talk about it. Start coming, because I think as evangelicals, we've drawn a sharp line between security as something the government does and our spiritual walk, which is mostly private. If you look at the history of ancient Israel, you see that your trust in an invisible God comes down to how you approach your yes. physical security. And so until we start applying a whole Bible view yeah. towards security, um, we're going to get nowhere. And so that's let, what let I would say. Let me just say that you hit on some verses that I would have used. Uh, where in the Hebrew Bible it says, the Old Testament, trust not in your chariots. Yes. Trust yes. not in your warlords. Trust not right. in your spears, your guns, and in your bombs. Your trust has to go beyond that. That's right. And your security must be in God right. and in the friends that you make. Right. And I would, I would say, too, because of the resurrection, we need to take a different pr approach than the world. I would, I would say, imagine this. What if the U.S. announced tomorrow that it had weaponized RU-486? and that it was going to threaten to use it on, a, on an enemy city. And the, the beauty of it was it was more moral than a nuclear weapon because it wouldn't destroy anything except unborn children. Is there any evangelical in this country yeah. who would not be on their feet saying this is an abomination and God will sure. judge a nation that does this? That's right. And yet that will do less damage than nuclear weapons that we turn a blind eye we're to when we're stop. talking about our security. We're we gonna, need a better world. We're going to stop. Evangelicals are pro-life people. Yeah. If you're pro-life, you've got to listen. So the likes of my friend Tyler Wig Stevenson and his whole program, and uh, it's Two Futures Project. That's right. That's the name of the organization, that's and right. that's the name of the movement. And uh, thanks so much. Blessings on you, buddy. I appreciate it. Thank you. What are some of your reactions? What are some of the questions that come to mind after listening to Tyler? Well, even before the questions, Tony, you know. As I was listening to Tyler, I'm thinking that subject is so huge and could be so overwhelming. I'm just thankful for people like him yeah. in the church yeah. um, trying to take a step in that direction. Because you could easily say, this is, yeah. how, how could I even begin to attack a subject like this? And I think not just this subject, but a lot, I, believe, I think that believers just shy away because the times are so hard and things are so escalating so fast year yeah. after year, you kind of want to retreat from it. The, the thing is that Red Letter Christianity is about bringing up these issues that we believe Jesus would bring up at this place and at this time yes. in history. And uh, evangelical Christians generally listen to people who are talking about nuclear disarmament and say, oh, they're a bunch of left-wing idiots who don't face the world they realistically. shut it down, yeah. And I thought it was so important that he brought out the fact uh, that uh, the most uh, intensely 
supposed president was the beloved Reagan. Ronald Reagan. Right. And when you think of militarism, you think of him. But he, in the midst of all of his military spending, was smart and saw that we have to put this in a special category. Right. You, you do have to ask the question, if you're a red-letter Christian, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? I thought you brought up a great point, um, Tony, about even the, the younger generation. How do we educate them? I mean, if you ask most young people about nuclear warfare, and they, a lot, you know, most of them wouldn't have a clue. So I think there is an element of starting to educate yeah. that generation. Because yeah. I think th this generation is smart, and I think if you put information in their hands, yeah. they get fired up to do something about yeah. it. Yeah, and, and uh, I stress that when you're talking to the evangelical community, yes. you've got to use the Bible. Yes. That's the hallmark of who we are and what we are. Can you make the case biblically? Uh, how seriously do we say uh, we should return uh, evil with good? We should overcome evil with good. Uh, and how does that live itself out in the context of this horrendous problem? Mm -hmm. You know, you're so much younger than I am. You really Not are. Too much. Uh, more than you think. <laughs> Here's the thing. Uh, when I, in the late 50s and the early 60s, mm -hmm. we were scared to death that the Russians were going to bomb us with bomb, nuclear sure. weapons. And people were putting bomb shelters in their basements. And I remember during school doing those. Yeah, they used know, to have air raids. War, uh, air raid uh, trials, you know. What right. would happen if a nuclear... And I used to be so scared because I would think, yeah, yeah, any day it would happen. And the church did not deal with the issue. Right. The church is not dealing with the issue. And a lot of young people are drifting away from the church because they're saying all the church is interested in is getting people into heaven when they die. Right. They don't deal with issues that are really pressing us in today's world, namely this issue. I'll bet a lot of our listeners will have to say it's the first time that they've heard an evangelical Christian mm -hmm. on Christian television mm -hmm. talk about nuclear disarmament. Right. It's one of those subjects we pushed off at the side, and over in the universities and in the colleges of the country, this is a live issue. Well, and, the, and, and, and you know, young people want to know, know that the church is thinking. Yes. You and know, they, when you say it's just about getting into heaven, as part of it is, you know, they don't, they don't think we are thinking. We gotta, we've got to combine the rational and the yeah. spiritual. Yeah, that's right. But above it all, there's the Bible that comes down and judges us and says, "Are you being faithful to the teachings of Scripture?" And you can't forget, Tony, that when talking about the Scriptures, do not fret, do not be anxious. Trust in the Lord. We could still have that peace in our heart even amidst the chaos. Go to the website, redletterchristians.org. Right at the top, you're going to find stuff about our show, and you'll find stuff about Tyler, so check it out. Keep the faith, brothers and sisters. Keep the faith.